Oh, oh dear. It's that time of year again. The leaves are falling from the trees, the nights are getting longer, the pumpkins are sprouting faces, and we are looking to the back catalogue of Jerry Anderson episodes in search of suitably spooky stories to revisit this Halloween season. Ah! We've already covered the top 10 scariest Space 1999 moments, so this time round we're steering clear of the live action shows altogether and instead focusing solely on the Super Mario Nation ones. Uncanny and frightening. So that doesn't include Terror Hawks or any of the animations or Twizzle or Torchy, because honestly we could do a whole video of the scariest moments from that show. It's just the ones that were filmed in Sweet Sweet Super Mario Nation. And we shall call this list. Five spooky Marionation episodes and or moments. Yeah, it's going to be a bit flexible, a bit of a hodgepodge, a bit of a Frankenstein's monster of a list, if you will. <laughs> Dr. Beaker. Hey, what, 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 what? And honestly, putting this list together was actually much harder than it might sound. For the most part, the Super Mario Nation shows didn't really go in for serious scare moments. And even when they did veer towards the darker stuff in later years, it was always more graphic violence than outright horror. However, I have personally trawled the length and breadth of the Super Mario Nation universe to bring you five episodes and or moments that definitely unsettled me when I first saw them. Since scares are often a largely subjective thing, you may find certain selections rather unsurprising, or I may pull up some moments that you don't agree with at all, or perhaps some that you don't even know. Anything can happen in the next half hour. It's also worth mentioning before we start that I am not now and never have been a particularly brave person, especially not when it comes to to scary moments in TV shows and films, so you may just have to bear with me if some of my picks are a little on the tame side. Let's take a closer look. And to start things off, let's go back to September 20th, 1991, to 6 pm on BBC2, to the very first Jerry Anderson production that I ever saw, and to something that absolutely categorically proves without any doubt at all that I am indeed a total, total. Wuss. Oh no. Number 5 Thunderbirds, the Hood's Temple from Trapped in the Sky. Yeah. Not the Hood himself, not his attack on Kirano or his glowing eyes or anything about him at all just the first establishing shot of his temple and its interiors. As soon as I first saw that at the age of six, I was creeped out to the point where I actually had to leave the room and go and do something else. I made up some excuse about needing to tidy my room and I was out of there. I mean, I'd seen the trailers, I'd been looking forward to this show all week, it looked amazing, it looked spectacular, and yet as soon as I saw this opening, I was done. I was like, well, I think I'd better go and uh, tidy my room. Yep. I'd love to stay and watch, but, you know, got some uh, room tidying to do. Looking back, it was probably a good thing I bailed when I did, because if just those opening shots scared me into running away, then the Hood's attack on Kirano and the first shot of his glowing eyes would probably have seen me running for the hills. And even today, that psychic attack scene still packs a bit of a punch. When will International Rescue start operating? I'm not sure how long I spent, quote, tidying my room, unquote, but it couldn't have been longer than five minutes, because when I did summon up the courage to put my head around the door, this is the first thing I can remember seeing. And suddenly, everything was okay. The scary place was gone, and here was something much more enticing to my young and oh-so-fragile mind. That's a great aircraft. It was my first proper sight of the kind of spectacle that the trailers had been promising all week. A bright and beautiful place I wanted to visit, as opposed to the dark and scary one that had so terrified me just a few minutes earlier. And because the rest of the episode stayed in that place, so I stayed too. Good timing. Great, Virgil. Just great. Needless to say, this scene never bothered me again, nor did any other scenes involving the hood, so I know what many of you are thinking right now. Nearly 30 years later, this is still your pick for the scariest moment of Thunderbirds? 
Not the giant alligators, not the rock snakes, not even the laughing heads from Thunderbird 6, which I have to mention because otherwise the comments section will be overflowing with people telling me I forgot about them. And to those people I say, yes, yes it is. Not only because this genuinely provoked a stronger reaction than any of those other moments did when I first saw them, but also because of the possible potential ramifications it could have had on my very existence. Have you gone crazy? And let me explain. I really feel like this is one of those big what-if moments of my life, one of those fragile little moments in time where if events had gone the other way then my entire future would have changed. What if I'd stayed in my room and not summoned up the courage to go back and take a second look? What if my parents had changed the channel and not allowed me to keep watching? No further transmissions, please. If I had been unable to continue watching Trapped in the Sky for whatever reason, if I had not been able to really get into Thunderbirds as a result of that, then the whole course of my life would potentially have been drastically different. That is what gets this scene a spot on this list, over any other moment from Thunderbirds. Not so much for the content of the scene itself, but for the thought that it could potentially have caused me to miss out on an entire childhood of epic memories that have stayed with me and will stay with me for the rest of my life. Thank you. All because of the hood and his spooky, spooky temple. Which really isn't all that spooky at all, actually, but like I said, I was then and still am a complete and total coward. Well, it's all a long time ago, Kirano. A long time ago. However, as ashamed as I am by this pick, I can at least stand by these next four as being at least slightly more respectable choices. That's just what you might get. So, moving on. Number four. Captain Scarlet and the Mysterons, the Mysterons. Will you take a look at that? Captain Scarlet is so littered with dark moments of violence and horror across its 32 episodes that it's hard to pick just one for a list like this. Ask a dozen different fans and you'll get a dozen different answers, that's just the kind of show it is. I know what you mean. So in giving the very first episode of the series a spot on this list, I do so not so much for the content of this episode of Captain Scarlet over any of the others, but more for its position within the wider Super Mario Nation story. But before we do so, let's take a look at what really happened. Because think back, what was the last Super Mario Nation episode the Century 21 team had made when the Mysterons went into production? Give or take a million. Yeah, give or take a million, the final episode of Thunderbirds. A dreary Christmas tale about toys and presents and children's hospitals and carol singing and whatnot that's so cosy and cutesy, I'm always surprised when I make it to the end without falling asleep. It's just about the safest and most predictable episode to carry the Super Mario Nation name. So for Century 21 to go from that to this... <laughs> in one giant leap was an astonishing gamble on their part. One could argue that the look of the new correctly proportioned puppets wasn't as much of a risk as the fact that the new show would literally be constructed around the concept of death. Yeah, get back to the children's hospital or orphanage or workhouse or wherever the heck it is you belong, little Nicky, because things are about to get a whole lot darker going forward. Gee. Previous Super Mario Nation productions had always shied away from showing death. It was mentioned infrequently. It just is not good enough. That aircraft cost not only 5 million pounds, but 600 lives as well. And Fireball XL5 or Stingray were occasionally seen blowing up an enemy vehicle or base. If you can help me, Marina, we can destroy the city. But you could probably count on the fingers of one hand the number of characters we actually see get killed in the Super Mario Nation shows leading up to Captain Scarlet. But now suddenly, death is an integral part of the show, and they're not going to sugarcoat it for the kids. Ah, oh! Innocent, ordinary people are brutally murdered and then resurrected under the control of an alien force that wants to destroy the world nearly every single week. It will mean the ultimate destruction of life on Earth. The very first scene of the very first episode terrifies its young audience with one of the scariest voices ever heard on television. This is the voice of the Mr. And then presents them with the sight of an ordinary man visibly transformed into a personification of death itself. One of you will be under our control. And that notion of Captain Black as an angel of death is only reinforced in the secondary opening credit sequence of every subsequent episode, where we see him lurking in a cemetery at night, waiting for his next orders from the Mysterons that will almost certainly involve someone else joining their ranks. 
do you see what I mean when I say it's so difficult to pin down any one moment that makes this show more inherently terrifying than any of the other Super Mario Nation productions? We're dealing with forces that we don't completely understand. Uh, take for instance the car crash which kills Captain Scarlet and Brown just a few minutes after the scene on Mars. The sight of Scarlet and Brown's dead bodies would easily be the most graphic image seen in any Anderson production up to that point, but it barely even has a chance to register between Captain Black's transformation and this. Captain Brown, are you all right? Yeah, spontaneous human combustion in a family show. The very first attempt by the Mistrons to kill one of their victims is, appropriately enough, the most spectacularly grim thing we ever see throughout the series, and is yet another reminder that we're now in a very different place than we were just a few months earlier with Thunderbirds. That is one of the few things I can be sure about as of this time. We're suddenly thrust into a series where even the title character is not someone to be trusted. Spectrum, this is your world president speaking. Ah. Wait, this guy is our hero? The guy who spends most of the first episode under the control of the baddies? This guy who we see killing someone in cold blood at the end of the opening titles every week? This guy who isn't even the original Captain Scarlet because the original Captain Scarlet died in a car crash five minutes into his own show? You are a very lucky man, Captain Scarlet. That first episode asks a lot of its viewers, and yet somehow manages to get away with all of it while throwing a huge bucket of cold water over the hope and optimism of Thunderbirds. In this show, not only is there no international rescue to save the day, but sometimes the good guys don't even save the day at all. And even when they do, chances are that the Mistrons have killed at least one innocent person in order to carry out their plan of the week. The Mr. Ron instructions will be carried out. That body snatchers crossed with zombie concept for the main antagonists of the new show was firmly established with this episode, and all the later moments of violence and horror that Captain Scarlet would become infamous for started here. <laughs> You're obviously carrying no weapons. Despite all the nasty deaths that followed, the show could never again be as much of a shock as this episode was on first viewing. Well, except for one more episode that we'll be talking about in a little while. Yes, sir, Colonel Sir. But even today, I'm still genuinely amazed by the kinds of things they got away with in Captain Scarlet, simply because the stars of the show were puppets rather than live actors. That is definitely Captain Scarlet. Number 3 Fireball XL5 – The Last of the Xanadus Despite being the most child-friendly of the shows featured in this video, Fireball XL5 could at times be a remarkably atmospheric and eerie series. Being shot in black and white often lent the show an almost film noirish quality, with long sinister shadows threatening to swallow our heroes whole. Oh, if only I wasn't so scared. Throw in some often very strange looking alien creatures, and even at times some rather sinister puppet designs for some of the human characters. <laughs> And you had a series that could often be rather creepy whether it was trying to or not. When it was trying, it often succeeded admirably, and nowhere was that more clearly evident than in The Last of the Xanadus. We're doomed. Meet Kudus, the last survivor of the frozen planet of Xanadu. He passes his time in his throne room surrounded by terrifying portraits of his ancestors, including what appears to be David Bowie, listening to recordings of them chanting his name. <laughs> although I'm not sure how they could record themselves chanting his name before they died, although Professor Matic later refers to the residents of Xanadu as Coolest creatures. So maybe he just named himself after his own race, but the point is, he likes to listen to recordings of dead people chanting his name. So yes, this episode wastes no time in establishing Kudus as a deeply sinister figure who's clearly not all there, and the puppet has clearly been designed with that in mind. Seriously, what's going on with those eyes of his? I bid you! See. But Kudus has more on his agenda than just making speeches to empty rooms. He has hatched a plan to rid the universe of a race of beings that once overran the planet of Xanadu and almost wiped out his entire race. The Lazoons. Yeah, apparently Zuni and his brethren are a plague on the universe, which actually explains a lot. <laughs> 
and Kudus has been working hard on a virus that will destroy them all. A conditioned messenger is on his way to Earth to administer the first dose. He also has one major Jim Ireland, a human explorer who made the mistake of landing on Xanadu only to fall victim to Kudus's mind control powers. I'm his slave. The price I had to pay. So, yeah, we're now quite a way into very unusual territory for Fireball XL5, and the Kudus craziness doesn't end there. Because he literally has the ability to teleport into your bedroom and threaten you in person. Destroy the Earth to a kid, monsters in your bedroom is just about the scariest thing imaginable, and I'm not too ashamed to admit that, yes, as a kid I did have one or two nightmares about Kudus doing just that. Forever you will be the slave of Kudus. Major Ireland soon succeeds in infecting Zuni, who is very soon at death's door. <coughs> However, there is one possible hope for a cure. The water of the frozen fountain of eternal life. But we'll never get away with it. And now that Zuni, a character we like, well, tolerate, well, are familiar with, is in mortal danger, it's a race against time to save him. Next stop, Xanadu. Arriving on Xanadu to get water from the fountain, after passing through a catacomb of mummies, yeah, the show's really going for the creepiness factor this week, the XL5 crew are ambushed by Kudus, although Steve's ray gun makes short work of him. Now that you've smashed the fountain of life, Kudus has become an old man. Oh, don't give this puppet a close-up, it's really not necessary. Well, there's nothing we can do for him, Matt, but we may still be able to save the Lazoon. Come on. Yes, with his plan in tatters and his body ravaged by old age, Kudus decides it's time to put an end to his vendetta and just enjoy what little time he has left. All is lost. Nah, I'm just kidding, he kills himself. Now I'm not entirely sure, but this may well have been the very first time I ever saw a character on television commit suicide. And back at the age of 8 or 9, this just cemented Kudus as one of the strangest and most unsettling villains I'd yet seen in the Super Mario Nation universe. And even today I still find him strange enough that his madness lends this story a slightly more nightmarish air than most. Great news! Now for many people this may just be yet another episode of Fireball XL5, but to me, this was one I saw at just the right time to send a shiver up my spine that even all these years later is still there just a little bit. Kudus! Kudus! Also, if Zuni has drunk water from the Fountain of Eternal Life, does that mean he's going to live forever? Because that's a pretty terrifying thought on its own. He's going to live forever. <laughs> Stingray, Invisible Enemy. As I mentioned previously, my first exposure to many of the Anderson shows came in the form of the early 1990s repeats on BBC Two. We must do this again sometime. When they were repeated again and re-released on DVD in the early 2000s, I finally got to revisit my childhood memories of many of my favourite stories, as well as catch up on one or two episodes that I'd missed the first time around. In the case of Stingray, there were about a dozen episodes near the end of the series that I had never seen before, because after Titan Goes Pop, the BBC had moved the show from Friday evenings to Sunday lunchtimes, and I didn't always remember that it was on. Invisible Enemy, however, was the only episode that definitely aired in a Friday night slot that I had absolutely no memory of at all. What I was doing the night that episode aired, I have no idea. In other words, you don't know the cause. At the moment, no. But considering my previous track record of being terrified by not very scary things, it was probably best that I missed it at that age, because when I first saw this episode on DVD as a teenager, I was genuinely surprised by how spooky and suspenseful a story it was. The treat's on me! It sets an eerie tone right from the very first scene, but the story's masterstroke is how effectively it turns the familiar setting of Marineville into something more sinister, as the base and all its operatives fall victim to an invasion by stealth, carried out by one middle-aged man in his pyjamas. I wonder what it all means. We've seen Marineville invaded before, of course, most notably by Agent X20 who can apparently come and go as he pleases, although never to do anything more sinister than deliver lectures or clean the windows. <laughs> 
With Thompson, a seemingly ordinary if catatonic man found adrift at sea by the Stingray crew, we have something altogether more sinister, as he soon begins to rise from his bed and attack our heroes. Not through force or violence, but through a simple hypnotic signal projected from a device in his watch. Whether through accident or design, the puppet sculptors created a character that simultaneously manages to look completely harmless, and yet has a definite sinister quality when he suddenly appears unannounced at a window or in a doorway, come to incapacitate another of our regular characters, and in the process, reduce Marineville to nothing but a ghost town. Setting the story mostly at night only heightens the atmosphere, of course, but the fear factor is really provided by setting this story firmly in Marineville, literally the home of Stingray. Marineville's beaten, just beaten by something we can't even see. It's always been this bright, colourful place, clearly so well defended against conventional attack that it should be one of the safest places on the planet. In fact, the whole base is designed to be self-sufficient in the event that it needs to be completely cut off from the outside world, and despite occasional rocket attacks, we all know that nothing bad will ever really happen to Marineville, but yet, in this episode, it does. Oh, it's spooky. We see these familiar safe surroundings take on a sinister air as the zombie-like Thompson stalks the base completely unchecked and seemingly unstoppable. It's suddenly a dark and dangerous place to be. And what makes all this even more unsettling is that many of our regular characters aren't around to reassure us that things will be okay. Troy and Phones are away for much of the episode, while Atlanta and Lieutenant Fisher are among the first to fall. So we're in unfamiliar territory almost from the moment Thompson's attack begins. That man Thompson has brought some kind of disease into Marineville and it's getting a foothold. Instead, it's down to Commander Shaw and Dr. Doc to hold the place together until help can arrive, as one by one their friends and colleagues fall victim to an ailment that seems to have no cause and no cure. Let me know if there's any change in Atlanta's condition. And take care of her. She's all I got. And by the time Troy and Phones return from their patrol, Marineville appears to be almost dead. What goes on around here? As aside from Marina, not a single person remains unaffected by Thompson's device. They even got the security checkpoint guards and the tracking station guy. It's literally everybody we know. They've all got the same look, like the man we rescued. Now, unfortunately, I've never found the resolution of this story to be particularly satisfying. As everything happens so fast, you don't even really get a chance to find out who was behind the attack to paralyze Marineville, and then you almost get whiplash at the sudden shift in tone from serious atmospheric drama to... Well, I guess that's ruined their little plan. Yep, another emergency over. Everything's fine, and let's go home. It's all over now. Luckily, there's no harm done. However, a slightly disappointing ending is more than worth it for 20 minutes of a really effective little mystery story. We know everything has to work out okay in the end, but with this episode, you really do feel like it just might not happen this time. We'll just have to watch our step. I wouldn't have wanted the show to be like this every single week, but Invisible Enemy showed that Stingray could, and maybe should, have tried to spook its viewers just a little more often. And if somebody could tell me how exactly Thompson manages to get up to the control tower window to paralyze Commander Shaw, I'd really appreciate it. Seriously, it's like an eight-story building with nothing to hold on to. How's he doing that? I don't get it. I just don't get it. Number one. Captain Scarlet and the Mysterons attack on Cloud Base. It had to come, Colonel. The penultimate episode of Captain Scarlet is also one of the show's most polarizing. Some people hate this one, some people love it, and I'm firmly in the latter camp. Thank you. Although I'm not blind to a fairly major flaw, but we'll get to that in a bit. But right from the start, this episode just feels different from the others, partly because it's rather rare to open an episode with a member of Spectrum. Emergency, I've been hit. As Symphony Angel crashes in the desert and collapses from the heat, the music and imagery establish a rather doom-laden atmosphere even for Captain Scarlet. After the Mistrons once again threaten to destroy Cloud Base, the base goes to red alert. Yet much of the first half of the episode just involves our heroes kind of sitting around waiting for something to happen. It's a perfect way to instill tension in the viewers, especially as we see characters restless or angry or nervous as they wait for something to happen. It's going to be a long night. We're used to seeing what the Mistrons are up to long before Spectrum find out, and yet this week, we're just as much in the dark as them. The Mistrons seem to be doing absolutely nothing, and it's just so frustrating. Action stations. 
Wonder what it can be. But then, suddenly, the shocks start to come thick and fast. I just don't believe it. A Mr. On spacecraft, something we've never ever seen before, approaches Cloudbase, and Rhapsody Angel is killed while investigating it. No last minute escape, no just in time rescue, and not even a body. One of our regular characters, who coincidentally was always my favourite of the Angels, is blown to pieces just as coldly and callously as dozens of guest characters have been before her. Rhapsody! It's no good, Lieutenant Green. She must have been blown out of the sky. And then it's right back to the waiting again. The Mysterons have clearly shown us what just one of these spacecraft can do, so now they can afford to sit back for a bit and let the cloud base crew stew a little. I can't bear this waiting. You mustn't let them break your nerve. They'll come, soon enough. So that when two dozen more spacecraft finally show up, it's obvious that things are just about as bad as they can be. Rhapsody Angel is already dead, and it's very clear that more of the regulars are soon going to be joining her. This is our fight, and I'm sure you will all do your duty. And here's where this list is coming full circle, because when I first saw this episode, I was actually genuinely too scared to keep watching to the end. Yep, that's right, this is the only Anderson episode I ever actually turned off on first viewing because I found it too scary. Steady. Rhapsody's death was a real shock, hinting at the possibility that not all our heroes would make it out alive this week. And as the final assault on Cloudbase began, Dr. Fawn's death all but confirmed that the Mysterons really were going to slaughter absolutely everybody. But it was the scene of Captain Blue reporting Fawn and Scarlet's deaths to Colonel White that really sent me reaching for the remote. I want Scarlet in the control room. How long will he take to recover? The fact that Cloudbase, the one normally safe place in the Captain Scarlet universe, wasn't just surrounded by Mysteron spacecraft but had clearly already been infiltrated by the Mysterons, well, for whatever reason, that was too much for me to take. I had to go outside and play with some friends, but even while we were playing, my mind was reeling from what I'd just witnessed, and full of thoughts as to how the rest of the Cloudbase crew were dying. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, hold on a minute, how could you possibly believe that they really all died when there's one more episode of Captain Scarlet after Attack on Cloudbase? Well, maybe because the first time the BBC screened Captain Scarlet, starting in 1993, they didn't actually air the final episode. They held the Inquisition back for some reason and didn't show it until the start of the next repeat run the following year. Oh, that's interesting. Go on. So on their first run, Attack on Cloudbase was the final episode. And for my nine-year-old self, it was hard to see how else things could possibly be resolved except with an overwhelming victory for the Mysterons. It's no good, Colonel. We're finished. Even when the episode was repeated a year later, I was watching from the doorway as my heroes got bumped off one by one. Is anyone else alive, Lieutenant? No, sir. Be of the last. And when the final revelation came of what had really happened, I still didn't feel especially relieved. Despite the it was all a dream ending, which is obviously a very significant flaw, to me, this episode has always seemed to present the most believable way that the war of nerves between the Earth and Mars could have been resolved. We'd seen enough of the Mistron's powers throughout the series to know that if they really made a concerted effort, they could overwhelm our heroes with ease. And now here was an episode that all but confirmed that yes, in an all-out attack, Spectrum and indeed the Earth itself would have zero chance in fending off the Mistrons. The bad guys would win and the good guys would die in attempting to stop them. The Earth itself would fall to the might of Mars, darkness would cover the land, any resistance would be crushed, and soon the Mistronized bodies of the dead would vastly outnumber the few remaining survivors. Even me? Even you, Captain Scarlet. And as the years have gone by, I've become more convinced that actually, that would be the perfect end to such a downbeat series. In fact, to this day, I kind of tend to mentally black out the last few minutes of the episode. I mean, I try. Everything we see after Cloudbase goes down is just a delusion caused by the last molecules of oxygen leaving Symphony Angel's brain as she slowly dies of exposure in the desert. I demand an explanation. Okay, yeah, that sounds a bit grim, but let's give it a try. Let's see how the ending could have looked. <laughs>
There now, wasn't that better? If nothing else, it's far more dramatically satisfying than... It was only a dream. Followed immediately by a clip show. Yes, Attack on Cloudbase is the one time that I can look at a Super Mario Nation episode that scared me back in the day and wish they had been brave enough to make it even scarier by really killing off all the characters. Oh, mon dieu. And yes, I know that wouldn't have been to everybody's tastes, but they so nearly did it that it's always going to be frustrating they never went all the way. I see. I'm sorry. However, what they did produce is still one of the most dramatic Super Mario Nation episodes of all time, with some great little character moments that could only be part of a story like this. Get your haircut, will you? Yes, Colonel. Coupled with, appropriately enough, a uniquely nightmarish atmosphere. We've never seen our heroes so completely overwhelmed like this before, and how each of them reacts to it is very revealing. Colonel White is determined in the face of adversity before revealing a softer, almost sentimental side. Uh, Adam, isn't it? Lieutenant Green is nervous and angry. Anyone can be brave if they're indestructible. That's enough, Lieutenant. And Captain Magenta. I'm still trying to count them all, Colonel. Well, bless him. Too eager. Far too eager. It's in Magenta's manic counting scene that we also get the most iconic images of Cloud Base surrounded on all sides by a seemingly infinite fleet of Mr. On spacecraft. And while not all the spacecraft models are 100% convincing in both look and movement, they're also strange enough that they kind of work precisely because we've never seen anything like this in the series before. Well, except on Mars, and on the Moon, and now. The Mistrons themselves have come to Earth to annihilate us. Love it or hate it, or maybe even both, Attack on Cloudbase is an iconic episode of Captain Scarlet that still brings quality scares more than 50 years later, by tearing down absolutely everything and everyone we've been watching over the previous 30 episodes. But then, it was only a dream. Well, yes, but... It was a nightmare. A terrible, horrible nightmare. Yes, we know, that's why it works so well. Oh, just go back to sleep, will you? Let the show have a proper ending. And that's it. Those are my top five scariest episodes and moments from the Super Mario Nation universe. I'm pleased to say I'm now scared. But what about you? Which episode scared you the most back in the day? What scenes still give you the creeps even now? And how much do you disagree with my list? Oh, you disagree? Let us know in the comments, and you have yourselves an altogether ooky, spooky Mario Nation. I know you will, Earthman. Thank <laughs> you.